down to uh, not only enjoy life, but to maybe make us slow down and, and hear his voice. Sometimes we're so uh, distracted by so many things that we don't need really to stop to listen after a while. We assume certain things, but sometimes how many of you have assumed the wrong things and have hurt yourself more than helped yourself? So when we accept Jesus in our life, uh, he gives us commands to live according to a higher standard, which is above and beyond whatever the world's standards are. Many times God's instructions will contradict with what we are accustomed to, because for the most part, we don't know. Okay? We're ignorant about it. We don't know what we don't know. We just continue to do bad things because that's our norm. Then there's God. He intervenes in our life and gives us a new way of living. Matthew 33 is a standard of scripture that we have. He says that to live, we, are, we must live according to God's ways. Above all else, what does God say? No compromising. Okay? Either you enter or out. And how we do that is by obeying His commands. Boy, I tell you, being a Christian is not easy. Can you hear me? It's easy to backslide. Yeah? Yeah? But it's necessary if we want to please God and to live according to His standards. Now, this is really appropriate to develop over what Dylan was dancing was at least the way. Okay? I spoke about the narrow road and how we must intentionally stay on it. The road, again, is uphill and long, if you want to. Okay? It's a long and windy road and difficult at, at some times. Okay? Recently, we have a uh, person that have really uh, experienced a winding road. Okay? Everything was going smooth and, oh, what happened? So God wanted me to slow down and to sit down and, and say that uh, I'm, the, I'm still in charge. No matter what is happening in your life, I'm still in charge and total control of your life. Your responsibility is to stop and listen to me. And if I did, then I would negotiate whatever winding roads are and whatever speed bumps are in the way. <coughs> and the devil, by the way, the devil, well, they make every attempt to discourage you from going upward and onward and try to convince you that you got to turn around and go backwards. It's easier that way. Okay? Following God is much easier than living a sinful life. Because once we know that, okay, we cannot go back. We just must get over our speed bumps. If we don't, then we'll hinder our journey. We'll just get stuck there over. Uh, 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 and we'll lose grip. It's just like getting stuck in sand. Then you lose your grip. When we have our speed, speed bumps, God is saying, be still. Know that I am God. I'm always in charge. Okay? That Psalms 46. Then. This well-known, again, verse, usually for comforting ourselves. Well, be still, God is with you. Okay? Or, be still, God is with you. Hey, God, be still, God is with you. God, God, God. And sometimes we speak Christianese, but we don't really know what that means. Okay? So, many people tend to think this verse needs to slow down, stop praying, don't forget to smell the coffee, drink the nuts, and smell the roses. And it's true. Stop putting the, uh, the pedal to the metal stick. Slow down. But it also means that we're constantly engaged in this spiritual battle against the devil and ourselves. And we cannot win our battles without God's help. We might think we're winning temporarily, but permanently we're damaging ourselves. So the first three speed bumps I talked about last Sunday was doubt, I believe, prayer, we don't pray enough, we don't communicate with that, and restoration, a house divided against itself, a church, okay, a relationship, okay, a team, a business divided against itself will not succeed. Can anyone relate to that? Okay. So the three more speed bumps I'd like to talk about today one of which is pride. When I take a look at that, uh, I remember um, Keith talked that I was borok in Philippines, prideful, arrogant, yeah? And they look at me and sometimes um, we're judged differently just because okay, we are confident in what we're doing. Some people take that out of context and say, hey, you show off, man, okay? When I took a look at that, pride is vanity. It's all about you. How about egotism? It's all about me. Selfishness. Me. I believe there's a trinity. Me, myself, and I. Uh-oh. When you start thinking that way, what happens is that 
you're on, you're on very, very um, timid grounds. Something's going to happen to you one day or another because it happened to me because my pride walked into the room before I did. Okay? Because I was so successful in so many things, whether it be business, whether it be speaking or teaching or sports, I've always, for some reason, I excelled in it. Okay? And uh, I thought, hey, I have to be good at this, right? In the military, I got all kind of accolades and I <laughs> attained a rank <coughs> that took some people five years. It took me about, uh, about a year. Okay? So I was considered, you know, everywhere I went, I was considered, you know, the next th best thing than sliced bread. You know what I mean? And after a while, you believe that press. Okay, you know that super stuff. Oh, you so good. Da, 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 da. And you know, too much smoke sometimes. Okay? So throughout scriptures, we're told about the consequences of pride. Proverbs 16, 18, 19 tells us pride goes before destruction. A haughty spirit before the fall, better to uh, be lowly in spirit and among the oppressed than to share hunger with the proud. That was me. A hunger on people went to places above things. Why? Because it was expected of me to be accepted with these in crowds. You know what I mean? So I got into debt. I went to places I knew I didn't need to be. Okay? I did things out of my character until God got my attention. Satan was cast out of heaven because of his pride. He had this selfish ego to attempt to replace God as the rightful ruler of the universe. Can you imagine? Satan saying, Do you think you are? I'm better than you. But Satan will be cast out in hell as we, we understand it and in the final judgment of God. But God uses him, okay, like Job, he uses him to make us stronger. Unusual, right? When you take, you take a look at that. Pride continues to stop many people from accepting Jesus Christ as their Savior. Do you know people like that? Nah, I don't need that. I don't need this. I don't need that. I'm okay. Admitting sin and acknowledging that in our old spread, we can do nothing about inheriting eternal life. It's a huge speed bump with prideful people. I was there. Don't need nobody. Why? I live really successfully because of me. Why is pride so sinful? Pride is given is giving others, giving ourselves the credit for something God has done in our lives, but didn't recognize it or didn't recognize that it was Him. Pride is essentially self-worship. Luke 18, 10 and 14 says, talks about the first in the text collector. Remember that story? If you read that, it says two men went to the temple. One was a proud, self-righteous Pharisee. And the other, a cheating tax collector. The proud Pharisee prayed in the spirit, Thank God I'm not a sinner like everybody else. Especially the tax collector over there. For I never cheat. I don't commit adultery. I, I go without food twice a week. I give to God a tenth of everything I earn. But the corrupt tax collector stood at a distance and dared not even lift his eyes to heaven as he prayed. Beating upon his chest in sorrow, exclaimed God, be merciful to the sinner. I tell you, this sinner, not the Pharisee, they returned home forgiven. For the proud shall be humble, but the humble shall be honored. Think about that. To take pride is an, in, an accomplishment is to, do, is to take pride in work. It's not necessarily wrong. When you do something good, you got to be proud of yourself. Or people say, that's a good job. Why? You did your best and people recognize it. The kind of pride that is wrong in the Bible's opinion is the conceited feeling of being superior to others. Or thinking that most people are stupid compared to you. Do you know people like that? How many of you have been looked down to by people at your work? Even people in church sometimes look down upon you. One of the things I, I cannot, I, I cannot tolerate is being disrespected. At a place where I eat. You go over there and you know what, the servants come around you and you know, how many? It's not high. Welcome. Thanks for coming. How many? And you sit down. 
What you like to eat? One time we went down to a all you can eat piece with, with, uh, with Keith and Albie took. It's called Camellia someplace? Yeah. We went down all you can eat type of, 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 of Korean food. And the waitress said, you better eat everything and don't take anything. No, don't take anything you can eat. Because expensive. Oh, what kind of place is this man? I mean, you pay a big bucks, all you can eat, but watch what you eat. Don't right? <laughs> we'll take anything home. Whoa, what is that all about? Okay, we ate fast and we left. Not it. Heck no. Okay, look at that. And just after we like, oh, did you enjoy yourself? Oh, come again. Oh, yeah, yeah, mine, the one we did. So it shouldn't be that way. Okay, pride comes. It stops many people from being saved. They, admitting their sins, it's really, really, really important that we do that. Okay? So when the Pharisees come, and sometimes we have this Pharisee uh, mentality. When you, go, when you go on mission, you see this, right? Guys in positions look down at, at the hungry or the homeless, and they treat them like rubbish. Even here in Hawaii, we have a blind eye of their needs. To take pride in its accomplishment, the kind of pride whereby you think you're superior over others. God doesn't like that. God who sat on the throne, creator of the universe, king of kings, the lord of lords, the creator of all things came for us because we needed his help. It wasn't beyond his capacity or, or, his, or his position to come to help us. Pride can be deceptive. A proud person is, can be centered on himself, me, myself, and I. He is self-made a successor because of me. God has nothing to do with him. Boy, can I relate to that. But the Bible encourages us to be humble and to weak. You know what weak is? It's not weak. It's strength under control. God says, be meek. You have nothing to prove. It's okay to be confident, but not arrogant. The attitude of a confident person, or he or she, has nothing to prove. Do you know people like that? You know they have money, they have power, but you know what? They're just ordinary people you can talk stories to. They don't say, I'm the president of this, I did that, da 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 It doesn't matter to them. But an arrogant person displays an attitude of superiority. and wants to control people, and he wants people to know. I've been in the corporate world for a while, or I've been in the military for a while, and you know what? It happens. Philippians 2, 3 and 4 said, Do nothing out of contentiousness or out of egotism, but with humility consider other, others superior to you, as you look out not only for your interests, but also for the interests of others. It's a we thing, not a we. How can we do it together? Okay? If you look at somebody who is who is very, very confident, he wants to make the other person look good. He doesn't with no strings attached. Pride, prideful and arrogant people put themselves in opposition to God. God hates the prideful people. First Peter 5, 5 and 6 is, all of you serve each other with humble spirits, for God gives special blessings to those who are humble. Let me repeat that. They were repeating. All of you serve each other with humble spirits. For God gives special blessing to those who are humble, but sets himself against those who are proud. If you will humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God in his good time, he will lift you up. Not you. You don't have to do anything. God will lift you up. So, the principle is, you can humble yourself or God will. You don't want to, to do that, don't you? But I didn't humble myself. God took everything from me. All of my money, all of my faith, all of my authority and put me in a bag for a year and a half. Boy, did he humble me. It was a good kind of humble because he looked at me. <coughs> so the question is, <clears throat> do people you know consider you a humble person? To people who really know you, consider them a person because you can fake it in public, right? And say, so, oh, you're so good. What do you think is the difference between being arrogant and being confident?
The second speed bump is initiative. When we see an opportunity to help, is our first response just to jump in and help? Or do we think somebody else is going to help, but not me? I have better things to do. There have been too many incidents in the news where somebody being abused, okay, and where very little people chose not to get involved. But at the same time, there were many people recording the incident on their iPhones and flashing it on YouTube or flashing it on social media. They've chosen to be a bystander, not difference makers. Church, we are the designated somebody else. When somebody needs help, we are, as Christians, should be like Christ and, and offer our help, okay? No matter what. Sometimes, you know, we're seeing people being abused by somebody, being loved by somebody. You know what? At the risk of just not doing anything, okay, we at least pray that God will intervene. Amen? How many of you can pray? All of us should know how to pray. Right? Intervene. Why? Because nothing happens outside our prayer life. If you see something that is wrong, pray right away. Don't delay. That's important. James 2, 14 and 17 says, What good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say that you have faith but don't show it by your actions? Can that kind of faith save anyone? Suppose you see a brother or sister has no food or, or clothing and you say goodbye and have a good day. Stay warm and eat well. But then you... Don't give the person any food or clothing. What good does it do good does that do? You see, faith by itself isn't enough unless it produces good deeds. It is dead and useless. When I see that, I tell you what, uh, especially when you go on missions, I I pray that some of you will go on missions. It will give you another perspective. Because God loves people more than anything. When you go on missions, you see, especially, you know, um, Rainbow went on missions and, and she came back changed. Why? There's a different perspective. We live in a country of milk and honey as far as they're concerned. Becky, but we saw some of these people and, wow, oh, especially little kids living in graveyards in the Philippines. It just breaks your heart. And sometimes we take our Christianity for granted of here because we want more and more and more and more. But faith without works, you can see somebody who needs help, but you don't at least offer help, at least offer prayer, then what's, what sense is it? God sometimes put these situations in front of us to test our faith, to see our hearts. What are you going to do about it? Another speed bump, looking out for, you know, when, when you look out for somebody else's, uh, when you see something, you're looking at, at somebody's needs. It will require some cost sometimes, some, some sacrifice of time and money, energy, and reputation, even privacy. But what, what did God do? It's not what would Jesus do. What did he do? When you read the Bible, you see all of these accounts of what Jesus was doing, not only saying. Jesus sacrificed for you and me. And he wants us to become more like Jesus. Yeah, and we become more like him when we sacrifice just like him and we serve just like him. In Luke, Jesus tells us the parable of the Good Samaritan. Everybody remember that, right? Who found a man beaten on the side of the road. He was stripped naked, okay? And was just pushed on the side of the road while a couple of church officials, okay, intentionally passed him. They had to step over him. But the Samaritan looked at that and he, okay, the least of these stopped to help the man in need. <coughs> the next gate, he took care of the injured man. And he took him to an inn whereby he could be administered more help. And the next day he gave the innkeeper two silver coins telling him, take care of this man. If his bill runs higher than this, I will pay you back the next time I'm here. A Samaritan, not a Christian, not a religious person, but a Samaritan. He did. Yeah, what he did was for a total stranger. He started to give first aid at the scene of the crime. 
okay, then he took him to a place where he could recover and pay for it. He didn't have to do it, but he did because of compassion. The Good Samaritan stepped in to help without any concern for his sacrifice that might, might be required of him. He focused on the in, injured man's need just, just as Jesus focused on our needs. This is the way God planned it. You assume responsibility for the needs of hurting people around you by trusting Jesus to meet all of your needs. All the money that we spent, all the time that we spent on other people to administer to their needs, God replenished. Over and over and over again. Proverbs 3.27 and 28 says, Never walk away from someone who deserves help. Your hand is God's hands for that person. Never tell your neighbor to wait until tomorrow if you can help them now. That's Proverbs 3, 27 and 28. So when I saw that, it was convicted. It really convicted me how many times that I saw people needing help and I chose not to see it because I was too tired, I was too busy, or too much or too much. God will present these speed bumps along our way just to see where your heart is and where, how strong your faith is. Do you believe or are you just saying you believe? Remember this, three words. Love does something. Let me repeat. Love does something. It may be small in your eyes, but not in God's eyes. Everything you do for Him and for others is a big deal with God. Okay? Your faith must be as small as a mustard seed, but when you use that faith and deeds, God will increase that and will bless your lives because why? He can trust you. If He can trust you with the little things, God says, okay, it is a precursor that I can trust you with bigger things of responsibility. Love does something. Love doesn't just say, I'm feeling sorry for what happened to that guy. Love seizes the moment, carpe diem, because this may never come again. The Good Samaritan did what he could with what he had in this particular moment. How many of you can do something? The guy is saying something. Is God saying to pray for somebody, to forgive somebody, to do, to serve somebody? Is God saying that I want to spend more time with you? Love does something. Matthew 20, 28 says, Your attitude must be like my own. For I, the Messiah, the Messiah, did not come to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. That blows my mind. Every time I read this, it should blow your mind also. Jesus Christ, the creator of the universe, the Lord of all, the beginning and the end, came for Nando in 1984. Came for you whenever it became for you. And he said, I love you, and love does something. I die for you. Serving is not something that you add on to your schedule to fill up your spare time, by the way. It's a full-time thing. How many of you are full-time Christians? Right? 24-7, 365. Remember this. There is no, okay? There is no rentals, okay? In heaven, it's full-time. No ARBs in heaven, full-time. You'll be there full-time. Okay, you know what serving is? It is the heart of a Christian's life. God came to serve, and you want to be more like God? Serve. Okay, Jesus said to serve and to give. Okay, He expects us to have the same attitude if we want to be more like Him. Jesus thought that spiritual maturity is never an end to itself. It's not enough to keep learning more and more. You must act on what you know and practice what you claim to believe. Hypocrisy. Bible study without service is leads to spiritual stagnation. Okay? Give you an example. This all comparison within the Sea of Galilee, <coughs> in Israel, and the Dead Sea. Okay, the the Sea of Galilee is a lake full of life because water comes in, then water goes out. In contrast, nothing lives in the Dead Sea. 
because there's no outlet. It is, I think, about 300 feet below sea level. So there's no, there's rich minerals inside of there. Everything is in there, but there's no life in there. Why? It doesn't have an outlet. Okay? Scripture says, okay, know what to do and do what you know. What we need to is an experience in serving in some kind of way, okay, even in our church, so you can exercise your spiritual muscle. As you mature as Christ, as Christ wants you to, you focus on increasing toward living a life of service. Jesus came to serve. Jesus came to help. He became a servant of all. Let me give you an example there. If you take a look right in front of you. Okay. What is the use of a sponge? What do you use a sponge for? Okay. Cleaning, right? Washing, whatever it is, right? A sponge like this has no, you can't, there's no use for a sponge like this if you don't use it, right? You said sponge is a sponge unless you use it. But, okay, so what you're doing is, okay, you want to use it. So a sponge is made to absorb, right? Absorb. But after it absorbs, you cannot absorb anymore, and guess what happens? Okay, to make it more absorbent, what you have to do is squeeze your sponge, okay, and go inside and put for more, okay, okay. It's filled again, squeeze your sponge, and do more. Okay, this is like serving. God is giving you gifts and passions and heart of service. But if you don't do anything, all you do is drip. You don't okay? God cannot use you anymore unless you start to serve, squeeze your sponge, and start serving so you can go back and get God's, more of God's grace and His mercy, okay? And infilling of the Holy Spirit. So why? This is why God has made you to serve one another. Everybody got down? Okay? Don't be just a, a sponge that just sits there. God made you, okay? okay? And fill you with His Holy Spirit with gifts and passion so you can serve others. After you serve, you come back again. This is why you come to God daily after you squeeze your sponge. So He can infill you with His Holy Spirit and with the passion of giftings and authority once again. So that's really important. Because why? The world is filled with wounded people. Can you hear the man? Some of you wounded today. But you have you've hit it really, really nice. Okay? Some of you came fighting to church today or didn't want to come to church today. But you came. Why? It's because you wanted to squeeze your sponge out and get more of God's Word. You know what? You, you can overdose on everything except God's Word. The more Word you get, the stronger you become. Okay? And that's really, really important that you spend time with God. Do you ever wonder how many people okay, you walk to every day, every day, even at work, some people of your neighbors, yeah, how's that? God bless you, da, da, da. How many of you realize that some of them are going through some stuff? Just like with Ed, when he comes in, he's very transparent about it, man. Comes around, everybody thinks he's really company. He's always very, very uh, jovial and all that. But he's going through some stuff, right, Ed? But once he admitted that, then God can work. Then we can pray for him. If you don't admit that you're wrong and need help, nothing works. So if you guys are struggling with something, okay, admit it. Okay, open disclosure. He said the prayers of righteous people are powerful. Powerful. So this is why we pray. I stop everything to pray for somebody. Don't come to church without being prayed for. Let me read that. Don't leave church without being prayed for. Okay, whether you put in a praise, a, a prayer request, or praise reports, or people can lay hands on you and pray with you. Okay, everyone can pray. Let me repeat that. Everyone can pray. And the prayer of righteous people availeth much, is powerful. And this is why the devil doesn't want you to pray or delay praying. I tell you what, you want to kick the devil in the face? Pray. Amen? So if you need prayer, 
It doesn't say that the pastor needs to pray. No, he says, pray for one another. How many of you are one another's? There you go. Okay. Don't be ashamed to ask for prayer. Period. Everybody got that? Everybody say get it. I got it. Good. So, many people are wounded physically. Many are emotionally trained. Some are wounded spiritually because of what somebody said, or that, or that, or that. You know that kind of junk. Some are wounded financially. Some just need love. Some just need a hug. Why do you think we hug at church? It's therapeutic. Lay hands on the seat second, they will be healed. Maybe that's the only time some of your husbands and wives get to hug each other. Okay? Make hugging, okay, if you're married, make hugging, okay, you have children, make hugging a normal in your life. Just hug it. Yeah? And that's very therapeutic. Okay, don't wait for conditions to get better. People need love. But the world needs love. We don't need another pasture. You know what this on? Okay, we don't need anything else. What the world needs out is love, sweet love. That's what Dylan Dutch did. And that was really, really important. Don't put off what you know you can do for somebody today. Even how small it is, it might be huge in your life. How about just a call? I just called to say, I love you. Man, I tell you what, it is amazing what that can do. And sometimes, you know, it's just good to hear his voice or her voice. Amen? God will ask you to seize the moment. So the question is, are you a person who offers help when opportunities are presented? What do you think of help? What do you think would happen if you volunteer? I'll do it. Okay? Pro bono. You know, I don't have to be paid for it. Why? Just because. Cool, yeah. The third is, oh, this is this is a heavy one. Hypocrisy. <coughs> okay. How I say, wow. Lip service, rubber lips. You say one thing but mean another. Hypocrisy deeply disappoints God, and it will get His attention. This is why God says, if you make a vow to Him, you better, you know, you better live up to your vow, or don't make one. Let your yeses be yeses, and your noes be noes. And I don't know is still a no. Amen? So, hypocrisy again, deeply disappoints our Lord, and it will get His attention. Yes, God is love. God is grace. God is mercy. God is forgiveness. But there is another side to God that many just gloss over. There is the anger of God, the righteousness of God, and the wrath of God. Do you know that God hates? Everybody says, oh, God is not cool, but God hates. How do you know? Proverbs 6, 6 